Good evening. I'm Doug Shear, Chairman of Artist Talk on Art. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation by Christo and Jean-Claude. Before we begin, I just need to make a few brief announcements. Next Friday, we're offering a dialogue between artist and writer Donna Markser and critic and historian Donald Cuspit, author of the recent book, The End of Art. That's here next Friday at 7 p.m. Toilets are on the fourth floor. There's no smoking in this room. If you have a pager or a cell phone, I would really appreciate it if you turn that off completely now, if you haven't already. We also ask that you refrain from taking any pictures at all until after the slides. Uh, and I'd like you to join me in welcoming back Christo and Jean-Claude. Hi, good evening. We're happy to be here. The lecture tonight will be 45 minutes of color slides in the dark. Afterwards, we will turn on all the lights and we expect you to be very courageous and ask us any question you please. However, we do not answer any questions about religion and no questions about politics. Excuse me. Sorry, this is the very dear friend. Is he here? I repeat, we answer all your questions except not about religion, not about politics, and of course not about other artists. <laughs> uh, if there are things we have not answered properly or to your satisfaction, please consult our website. Our web, in our website, you will find our entire life. It's all there. And the address is quite easy. It is www.christojeanclaude, all in one word, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-J-E-A-N-N-E-C-L-A-U-D-E, dot net. And um, there you will find all the important things. You will also find amusing things like Christo and I were born on June 13, 1935, both of us, at the same hour, but two different mothers. <laughs> and we uh, emigrated to New York City with our little boy, Cyril, C-Y-R-I-L. In 1964, we have lived downtown Manhattan at the same address for the past 40 and a half years. Probably we like it. <laughs> and uh, our son today is 44. We are very proud of him. When he was 26, he produced a documentary film for peace against war. And it, the film was nominated for the Academy Award, says the pride, proud mother. And he is a poet and a writer. He has six books published uh, five about his poetry and one about his many trips to Africa. With, and um, yes, we are very proud of him. We are going to start the slides yes. and uh, the rest will be with the questions and answers. We are going to ask you to turn off all the lights, but please wait until I'm sitting down so that I don't break my neck in the dark. Is that is working? Okay. Uh, we will discuss the two works in progress, actually. The, the Gates project for Central Park and over the river, the project for Arkansas River in the state of Colorado. 
Now we can put the lights down. All that. Now. No, no. Okay. No, no lights. Yeah. No lights. Yeah. Now. Yeah. All the lights. Thank you. Yeah. I don't need the light. It's a stupid thing. Uh, in 1964, uh, we arrived in the United States, and of course, coming from Europe, never been to the United States. The skyline of Manhattan. The architecture, buildings was very inspirational. This is the first proposal to do something in New York City. It was proposal to wrap two low Manhattan buildings, 1964, number one, number two Broadway, and number 20 Exchange Place. We started negotiating the permission with the owners of these buildings. I did scale models, drawings, photo montage, and after two weeks of negotiation, the owners of these two buildings think that we are lunatics, and the project stay only in the drawings and the sketches and the scale models. In 1968, there was the three weeks of non-exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York. There was the landmark exhibition, Dada, Surrealism, and Their Heritage, organized by Professor Rubin. And Bill Rubin and some trustee tried to make MoMA to be, ra to be the first rap public building. Again, we failed to get the permission. Some of you probably remember, summer of 68 was very turbulent and, turbulent and violent, and was, the insurance company was not willing to let the museum to happen in that way. 1967, 68, also we tried to work in another architectural building, another high-rising building in New York City, was number one Times Square. That time, uh, 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 number one Times Square, 42nd Street and Broadway was headquarters of a light chemical corporation. And of course, uh, we have more chance that we try to explain to the chairman of the board that the project will be very important. Dear friend of us, art collector John Powers, introduces to the chairman of the board, but again, after many discussions, scale models and drawings, we received no. And finally, the first RAP public building we did is a small Kunsthalle Museum in Bern, Switzerland. I always say that the Swiss people have a greater imagination than we're expecting, but I should give credit to the Harald Zeman, then director of the Kunsthalle Bern, and some trustee who was excited in supporting the proposal to realize that project. In 1968, also, we did that very tall 5,600 cubic meter air package. That is the site of the Seagram's building, Seagram building and uh, Park Avenue, 285 feet tall, 33 feet diameter, and its entire inflated structure in Kassel in West, West Germany. Already in that time, we started to work on project for the Australia, all organized from New York. And finally, we realized the RAP cost, who was the hub is in Australia, south of Sydney, where we cover a coastline, one and a half miles coastline, with one million square feet of fabric. It's about 33 miles of ropes, very near to, to Sydney, only nine miles from Sydney. We have a high cliffs, or 85 feet high cliffs to the sandy beaches. Back to New York, we start to work on the project in the West, and we start to uh, uh, negotiating the permission, and finally, in 1972, Valley Curtain was realized. This is the curtain, orange curtain of 160,000 square feet of fabric suspended on four main cable. That's the span of the valley curtain is exactly the same span like the Brooklyn Bridge. The central height of the valley curtain is 180 feet and the main foundation is 106, uh, 106, 360 feet. I, I would like you to look carefully. It is titled Valley Curtain because it happens to be a curtain in a valley. But the media who thinks we are the rapping artists and they believe we rap everything, they called this the wrapped curtain. In 1972, after Valley Curtain, we started to work on project in the Northern California. It takes quite a long time, four and a half years, through public hearings and court trials, and finally get, have the permission. And in 1976, running fence was realized. This is the 18 feet tall. 24 and a half mile fence running in Sonoma and Marin County, just about 60 miles north of San Francisco, crossing about 14 road, Highway 101, and finally western extremity of the fence finishing in Pacific Ocean for the quarter of a mile in beautiful Bodega Bay. Now this too, the media had the pleasure to call the wrapped fence. 
I hope you understand. The fence was really, really built by poles, steel poles, and cables, and fabric suspended in cable, in, in, under cables. Now, in 1978, we did that very intimate project in Loose Park in Kansas City, Missouri, where we cover the walkway with two and a half miles walkway with these very warm colors of fabric. We try to match the color of the foliage, autumn foliage of the trees. To the 70, all organized from New York, we moved to the west and, and in the Rockies, and we start to change our perception about New York, especially about the people. We see more and more that probably the most important things in New York City is the humans, the people who really use the space, the city, uh, before everything they walk so much. At some moment we were even contemplating using the sidewalks to do something, but probably we'll never get permission to do anything on the sidewalks in New York City. The only place where New York City people walk is in the parks, and there are many parks, but one parks with incredible uh, situation, or physically how it's situated, is Central Park. You know, the, this is topographic map of the area of Manhattan, and New Jersey, and Brooklyn, and other borough, and all the pink color uh, is building. You see how well uh, the Central Park is uh, Are you sure your mic is working? It's not working? Okay. You see how, how the park is entirely framed by the hundreds of city blocks all around the park. There are other parks, for example, Westside Park is diluted with Hudson River. Battery Park, you have a New York Bay. But even Prospect Park, which is in Brooklyn, you have a many big houses with gardens and a lot of tree. It's not so much cut out of any natural forms. The very first proposal to do on, on Central Park was very small sketch, but uh, this is how the park will look uh, in the winter time where the project is happening. You know, the important part of that project that it should be visible during the summertime or the autumn, even today, the leaves, they already fall down, you can see, but during the summer, the park is almost like a forest. Here's the very early drawings of 1979. And the proposal was very simple. We needed to build some kind of module to activate the most banal and the most in new space between new feet and first branches of the trees. And the first proposal is to be 1,000 gates, very modest number. The gates will be only 20 feet tall, very 20, uh, 12 feet tall, very uh, tiny, uh, like a pipe uh, poles. And of course, the fabric clumsily attached like shower curtain from the top part and cables. The park, the, uh, this is 79. You know very well that the park is entirely uh, uh, built and uh, um, made by the city of New York, by the architect Olmsted in Vox. They, the city of New York, New York bought the land and hired Olmsted in Vox to design the park, who is the, uh, his full image, there is not full, I must, <laughs> Olmsted in Vox designed the park. And of course, 150 years ago, and they designed a typical Victorian park. The park is surrounded with a stone wall between 40 and 48 inch, inches high, and you enter to the park only to the openings when the stone wall stop, there's a small opening, or big opening, it, that is the only way you can enter to the park. And these openings they call gates, by Mr. Olmsted in Vox. Actually, some of the gates have names, like the gates of the children, of the farmers, of the pioneers, of the merchants, and now projects start literally when you enter to the park. The, all the orange line, on that slide, you can see very well, <laughs> the, all the orange lines is the uh, walkway we like to use for our project. It's a 23 miles of walkway when we, we install our 7,500 gates. This is how the park looks in the winter time, where there's no leaves. That you see very well is very important for the project to have this long visibility. You can see the skyline of Manhattan. In 1979, early 80s, we start to work on the permits of the project. This is here, myself, Vijan, uh, no, sorry. This is the, how the project will be built. The structure of the gates today, or from the early 79 drawings, is uh, quite different, changed very much to the 25 years. Uh, we are using very thick vinyl pole. It's five by five inches square pole. The height of our gates were remaining always 16 feet tall. But the width of our gates would vary with the width of the walkways. We have 25 different width of the walkway Central Park, from 6.5 feet to 18 feet wide. But 
gates were remaining always uh, 16 feet tall. Now we see how that uh, model is repeated 7,500 times. In some way, the model is reflect how the park is situated in the Manhattan. The rectangular shape of this, our uh, poles reflect the rectangular shape of the hundreds of city blocks all surrounding Central Park. They are very geometric, geometric grid pattern. When the fabric is attached only on the upper part, horizontal part, moving in all directions, very sensually, very whimsically, whimsically, reflect the serpentine character of the design of the walkway system of Olmsted and Vox, and of course the bare branches of leafless tree and vegetation and Central Park. In 1979, early 80, we started negotiating the project with the city of New York at the Koch administration. Here, myself, jean claude very young, discussing with the Gordon Davis, Park Commissioner of New York City, uh, for starting uh, permits. We bring in this discussion visual material, drawings and collages about the gates and other photographs of other projects. And on his right side is our lawyer, Theodore Kiel. After that, we are going to the presenting the project to the Manhattan Borough President. You remember Andrew Stein was there. Again, we try to explain that we pay for the project, that will be only two weeks, there will be no harm anybody, we take care of but everything, and we listen to their objection and try to go through all this long understanding how it can be working with the community. It was very important also to present the project to the Cultural Commissioner of New York City. Fortunately, at that time was the friend of ours, Henry Gelser, former curator of the Metropolitan Museum. Henry was very helpful to move the project to the political maze in New York City. Unfortunately, Henry is not anywhere with us today, but he was ex extremely yeah, helpful in the early 80s. Also, there was a the number of influential leading citizens who have different positions and the public organization around Central Park. And see here, for example, we're presenting the project to the Martin Siegel, who was that time the president of the Lincoln Center, friend of our collector, Agnes Gunn, the president of MoMA is there. And basically, we try to build understanding to build the people know about the project and see more about the project. Now, another important part is that around the Central Park, there are five community boards. You know, the New York City have many, many community boards. There's the citizen uh, community board who they do not have the jurisdiction, but their opinion is highly listened and regarded in the city hall. There are five community boards around Central Park, and it was very important to present the project to this community board, listening to their objection or their point of view. For example, look how was happening that here is Community Board 7, who is the Central Park West, 59th Street, to Columbia University, to the Hudson River. And this meeting, we're bringing visual, like big wooden board with the visual materials, drawings, and photographs of tests. Uh, we have our engineers, our ornithologists, our soil special specialists, arborists. We answer questions about, about anything. And after two and a half years negotiation of the City of New York, the City of New York wrote 107-page book to say no. <laughs> now, that book was written, uh, delivered in February uh, 1981, but you know, we are working very much like architects, builders. We never work on only one project. We work simultaneously on several projects for permits because it would be very frustrating if we have a refusal and have nothing going ahead. Year before we have that refusal uh, of the Gates project, we start to work on project in Southern Florida, and Biscayne Bay. We get the permission in 1982, and finally, in 1983, and early May, Surrounded Island was realized. And this is Jean-Claude idea, that project. If you look carefully, you will notice that there is an island here, there is another island there, there were 11 islands all together, <coughs> and the island is there in the center, while the pink floating fabric is all around it and it floating on the water and it surrounds the island. But the media, who probably doesn't know the difference, <laughs> wrote about the wrapped islands. <laughs> we, of course, never wrapped any islands. And you, I don't have to explain to you, you know that England is not wrapped in water. England is surrounded by water. Now, we surrounded uh, 11 islands with six and a half million square feet of 
pink floating fabric. The fabric was attached in the beach area of the islands, floating 220 feet on the surface of the water, ending with a 12 inches octagonal shape boom and anchoring with a thousand marine anchors on Biscayne Bay. Now, this, uh, between the north and uh, south area of the islands is the seven miles. Biscayne Bay is the, like a huge water park. Over two me and a half million people in Dade County, they live all around there. And of course, the project was only about miles from Miami International Airport, can be seen from air, can be seen from the causeway, from the high-rising high building, and of course, from the water, because the, the bay is like, like that water park, and people use entirely easily the water. Actually, this island was man-made islands. You know, they dredge intercoastal waterway in the 20s, and they pile the earth and the islands, the vegetation start to grow. Uh, we live in Paris between, I live in Paris between 1958 and 64 when I met Jean-Claude and we did important project in the early 60s, I will show later. But living in New York uh, in the 70s we were contemplating return back to Paris and do some more substantial work. We started to, many years before Surrounded Island, in 1975, we started to negotiating the permission for wrapping of the oldest bridge in Paris, the Pont Neuf. We have a Two, two refusals, and finally, in 1984, we get the permission, and in 1985, the Pont Neuf was wrapped with this 450 square feet of this champagne color fabric using about 15 miles of ropes. And for two weeks, over three million people worked day and night around the Pont Neuf. Now, all this project we do is all about aesthetics, and the way even how we finance and pay for our project is aesthetical decision. Of course, aesthetics in a larger sense, not only color, proportion, form, and movements. You know, we, uh, we do pay our project with our own money. That is the philosophically and absolutely decision. We don't accept any sponsors, no grants, no money from industry, from anybody. It's our own money. We're not independently wealthy. The money we have is simply coming from the sale of the works of art. I do with my own hands, and of course, uh, they are all a variety of works. Most of them is the preparatory study for our large project. Very much like an architect or sculpture, I put on paper our vision. Sometimes it's my vision, sometimes it's Jean-Claude vision, and I put it on paper using a variety of means, photography, paper, collages, and I can show you here how that is happening. Uh, 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 this is f uh, the next image is in my studio in Manhattan, where in the fifth floor, uh, over 40 years, I have no time to clean my studio. You see here, <laughs> in the corner of smaller area of the studio, I do the smaller sides works. They're between eight and a half, 11 inches, to little bigger sides, and they're called collages because I glue variety of materials. And uh, they really uh, try to translate how the projects we look, and they're used for many reasons. First, they're used to bring this original work's preparatory study to the, for the permits, and also to convey the people that the work would look exciting. When after I do little work like that, the collage is looking like that. This is the preparatory study for the Pond Earth project. It's in the two parts. The left side is uh, 13 and a half inches by 26 inches. The right side is 20, uh, 13 and a half by 12 inches. Now, the left side is done with the Pencil, charcoal, pastel, wax crayon. I using real cloth to simulate the fabric of the pond nerve, but not the real fabric we use in the pond nerve because it's a different scale. And I use the twine to simulate the ropes. We have a section of Paris aerial photography where the pond nerve is situated with the island of the city in Notre Dame, and actually a reproduction of renderings of the 16th century of the architect de Marchand and de Cerceau who designed the pond nerve. Now that preparatory study for the Pont Neuf is in the private collection in Belgium. Now this is another preparatory study for the Gates project, more recent, is the same dimension. The fabric section of the panels is real fabric, again, much finer fabric. I cut the paper, I create these folds and pleats, and I draw with a pastel pencil of the fabric. The upper section, you have a, that typical area where that particular area is situated. <coughs> And of course, they have also s fabric samples of the real fabric we use for the Gates project. I, I use very much a lot of photography. I draw over photography. I ask my, our friend photographer, Volgan Falls, to take pictures from there to there in the project. This original work is very small. It's only about eight and a half by uh, 14 inches. Uh, and of course, 
uh, I draw with a wax crayon, enamel paint. Um, you see this orange grid line helped me to, trans to use that little sketch to make a larger piece. Now the large drawings, I put the drawing paper on the wooden board and I hung that wooden board and not another glamorous place in my studio, quite falling apart. You see here, for example, I am making drawings about the rice stack project. The little study is on the left side. I draw and when the paper is, the work is finished, it's looking like that. Now this is the 65, 42 by 65 inches, the lower part, and 15 by 65 inches, the upper part. It's the lower part is done on pencil, charcoal, uh, 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 wax crayon, and of course the upper part, you have a cross section of the building, architectural of the building, who help us to calculate the fabrics, and of course the photograph of Wolgan of the Reichstag with the Brandenburg Gate. That drawing is in a private collection in Berlin. The larger drawings, the 96 inch drawings, that is the preparatory study for the umbrellas project. There was blue on Japan, yellow in California, 96 inches, the right side by 42. And the left side, you have the Ibaraki Valley, when we installed these 1,340 blue umbrellas. There are 1,340 blue dots there. And the upper there, the small village of Jimba, when we installed, on that village of 30 houses, we installed over 100 umbrellas. Each umbrella was 20 feet tall, 29 feet diameter. Now, I take this original work from our upper floor, the fifth floor, and bring it to our secondary floor, when usually we're receiving the potential buyers who come to buy the original works done by my own hand. By the way, all these original works that are done by myself, I do not have assistant. Ask how many artists at 70 years old can tell you that. No assistant. <laughs> I framing my works myself also. Nobody can do anything in this, my studio. Now, uh, the collectors, they come, or the collectors, the dealers, the private dealers, museum, they come to our uh, uh, home, to our second floor. They choose the work, they give us money, and they take the work. This is how we have money, I hope you understand. There are no other mystery. Sometimes the collectors try to choose uh, some early pieces. I can say, show here an early piece from 1961, it's called Package. That was belonged to Herbert Dorothy Vogel, the very fine, extraordinary collector of the New York City. And Herbert Dorothy Vogel gave that package to the National Gallery of Washington. Actually, National Gallery of Washington, with the gift of Herbert Dorothy Vogel, they own over 60 works of ours. Now, some, between 1963 and 67, I recuperated from the street uh, uh, part of demolition of the doors and storefronts and rebuild the storefront inside. Like I put the glass, I put the fabric, curtains, and, and the, when the storefront is built, it's something like that. You see there are light inside, you cannot see anything through the glass, you cannot open the door. This works was like a precursor of running fence and valley curtain. For example, that storefront is in the, in the collection of the Hirschen Museum in Washington, D.C. Now, the collectors come to the studio, they buy the works, they give us the money, and it's our money, and with that money we can do everything we like to do. I can have a much bigger studio, probably cleaner studio. I can have a house in the south of France, or house in Colorado and Aspen. Instead of that, we spend $26 million of our money to realize the Umbrellas Joint Project for Japan in the United States. We install 1,340 blue umbrellas in Japan, and 1,760 yellow umbrellas in Southern California. Each umbrella was 20 feet tall, 29 feet diameter, 640 square feet surface. The length of the project in Japan was the 12 miles long and two and a half miles wide. 90 umbrellas of Japan were starting in Sato River. And the length of the project in California was 19 miles long and two and a half miles wide. <coughs> part of Los Angeles, Los Angeles County and part of Ken, Ken County, just about 60 miles from Los Angeles International Airport. Now, would you believe that some journalist called them the wrapped umbrellas. <laughs> now, many, many the, years The ago. reason I have to tell you this, uh, I don't like to be mean with some journalists. Most journalists are great. Some are really completely idiotic. But it's not only the journalists. We were last night uptown at a cocktail party, 
and a lovely, very rich lady covered with diamonds asked us when we st uh, what day are we starting to wrap Central Park? <laughs> many, many years ago, before we have idea about the umbrellas, in 1971, we start to work on the permits to wrap the former Parliament of Germany, the Reichstag, of course, today the Parliament of Germany. We worked to the long period of trying to get the permission. We have the first refuse, refusal to wrap the Reichstag in 1977, the second refusal in 1981, the third refusal in 1987. When the umbrellas were standing in Japan and California, the Speaker of the House, the President of the Parliament of Germany, Professor Dr. Rita Sussman, sent us a letter congratulating us for the umbrellas and of course, saying us that she would try to help us to chart a permitting process for the Reichstag project, and probably now the middle window of opening a chance to realize that project. Jean-Claude and myself we were very excited, but we already have idea for another project, and that is a project for the Over the River. I will show you the very early drawings for the River project. Even the title was wrong. It was called the River Project. The little drawings, they're only eight and a half inches by 11 inches, was proposal to suspend fabric panel way above the water. You can see the project from above walking on the banks of the river. I glue a little person there on the left side. He can go down to the river. He can experience the project from underneath. Now this little first drawing, very early sketches from 1992. Herbie, Dorothy Vogel, they bought it and they give it to the National Gallery. <laughs> and of course, we were very excited with that project, but at the same time we were very excited also that there's a chance for the Reistec project. Between 92 and 93 and 94, we spent 180 days in Germany, in the capital of Germany at that time, the city of Bonn, lobbying the over 600 deputy of the German parliament to let us wrap the Reichstag. Only during the summertime, especially the month of August, when the deputy was on holidays, we have time to uh, devoted to our river project. We Jean-Claude and myself we were very eager to do that project in the United States. And you're familiar that most of the great river in the United States, they're born in the Rocky Mountains. Rocky Mountains divide the water in the east and west. Some of the river go west to the Pacific Ocean, some of the river go east to the Mississippi River and Gulf of Mexico. This is why in August of 92, and 93, and 94, myself, Jean-Claude, and our collaborator, we drove 15,000 miles investigating 89 rivers in the Rocky Mountains. And from these 89 rivers, when they start like little brooks and rivers and villages and towns and bridges and highway, railroad tracks, from these 89 rivers, we come to six possible choices. There was the two possible river in the state of Idaho, Piat River, northwest from Boise, Idaho, in section of Salmon River, section of the Wind River in the state of Wyoming, Two possible river in the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, north from Denver, Cache La Poudre River, and south from Denver, Arkansas River, and section of Rio Grande in the near New, New Mexico Colorado, Colorado border. In 1964, 1994, we get the permission for the Reistec, and for the next one and a half years, we devoted all our time, energy, money, effort, intelligence, and finally, and June of 1995, the rice tag was wrapped with this one million square feet of very thick fabric, silver, actually, aluminum uh, pulverized focus, fabric. Focus, please. And, uh, and, for and the project was late June, early July, and for two weeks, over five million people walked day and night around the rice tag. After two weeks of exhibition of the project, we removed the materials, and the materials are recycled for industrial purposes. Uh, we returned back to work in New York for the over the river the gates. The gates project was developing slowly but surely because there was the important part happened between 1980 and 95. You know, the park was in very bad condition. The Gordon Davis and Betsy Barlow, the uh, Central Park curator at that time in 1979-1980, they created the Central Park Conservancy. The very wealthy 32 movers and shakers of New York City we spend their own money, and they spend over $300 million of their own money up to now to keep the park in that shape. And it was very important that uh, we understand that we will never get the project happen if the Central Park Conservancy do not tolerate our project. And our work was basically to start to introduce the project and try to mellow or articulate our project to the member of the Conservancy. 
back to New York. We start to work on that, but of course, was not sure that we'll get the permission for the gates. We need to go back to work also on over the river. I make the noise? With your feet? No. No? No, I don't, I don't make the noise. No, we, we I don't know, I don't, probably. I like that now. I don't know. I make the noise? OK. And summer of 96, we returned back to the six rivers and the Rocky Mountains with much more bigger team to take a lot of measurement to finalize what river is most suitable for our project. We need to, the yellow ropes simulate the steel cables we need to install to support our fabric. The fabric will be hooked on these steel cables, and we take the measurements from the distance from the water to the cables, the height of the banks, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the relation of the banks to, the, to the, all the roadways and traffic around there. All these elements will need to be correct, corrected write it, and by the late 96, early 97, after two weeks spending in the Rocky Mountains, we, term, we, term, we come to the conclusion that for aesthetical and practical reason, the most suitable river for our project is Arkansas River in the state of Colorado. Now, Arkansas River, this is a section of the state of Colorado. Uh, the Denver is in the upper right corner. And uh, we like to use uh, Arkansas River, around 40 miles of Arkansas River, to install seven and a half miles of fabric panels and many sections, many interruptions. The Arkansas River is the, uh, uh, you have a two entrance. One entrance from near Colorado Springs, is on one hour driving from Colorado Springs, you're on the eastern entrance. Another entrance, entrance to our site from Aspen, one and a half hour, you're on the western entrance of the project. Having the Arkansas River is also, we take photographs, is images, because to see that Arkansas River is one of the main reasons we choose that pro, uh, river is because it's so ordinary, it's so used by hundreds of people. Their town and villages and factory and school, their highway on the south bank of the river, 101, uh, Highway 50, their railroad tracks of Union Pacific and the north bank of the river, and before everything, Arkansas River is most rafted river in the United States. Very gentle rafting, category two, and only two, three occasions, category three. And of course, they have about 300,000 rafters during the summertime. We love to do the project during the summertime, because to see the project, it would take about one hour to drive on the road. But to see the project from underneath, it would take about six hours to raft into the project. And of course, having the site, I start to do drawings and study with the real sites. This is here the collage of the, over the river. The fabric panels, again, they real cloth. I cut out, I glue, and make the folds. And you see typical interruptions when you have the vegetation or rock formation. And I simulate the steel cables when you have the interruption with the, with the twine here. On the right side, you have a map with the dot particular location of Arkansas River. When you go down to the water, the project, the width of the fabric <coughs> varied with the width of the water. Sometimes it's the 45 feet wide, sometimes the fabric is 120 feet wide. But the steel cables go much further away, anchor on the banks of the river. And of course, the banks, they're not always horizontal. Some of the, on the side is high, another is lower. Now the fabric we use is a very heavy woven fabric, porously woven that from above, you cannot see the river. It's a silver color. But from underneath, you can see all the clouds, rock formation, and of course, you have this tremendous uh, uh, contrast on light and shade. For all our projects, the most difficult part is to get the permission. It sometimes takes many, many years. And of course, you know very well that everything in the world is owned by somebody and belongs to somebody. The curiously now, when we start working on that project, we discover that all the stretch of 40 miles of Arkansas River is entirely owned by the federal government in Washington. By the way, United States federal government is the biggest landowner of the United States. They own 20% of the land in the United States. They have special ministry, Department of Interior, only in charge of the forest, the land, the rivers. And of course, they have special office in the Department of Interior called Bureau of Land Management. They take care of the land, but also they lease the land. They rent the land to the states, to county, to private corporation, to different agencies. And we discover 
that to get the permits for our project, we need to have the permits for the federal government in Washington, state of Colorado, two county of Colorado, 17 governmental agencies, two private corporations. But before we go to all this entity, we need to introduce the project to the community living there. You can see here, for example, in the small town of Salida, in the western entrance of the project, and the town hall, we're explaining the project. Salida is a little town, mostly populated with senior citizen hippies who arrived there <laughs> in the late 60s. And these meetings, we put images of previous projects, we answer questions, and really we try to explain how the project will be built, how it will be realized, how it will be seen by the people, and how we can take care of the everyday life of these people living there. From there, we're moving to the Canyon City when we succeeded to convince that all these different uh, entity, federal government, the state, uh, state uh, of Colorado, the county, and the different agency, and the two private corporations that they put together and they created permitting team that at least we can talk to them, not go one after one, we take years and years. Finally, they agree of that and you see how this happened. Here meeting in Canyon City, and the left side is our team. You see, uh, our chief engineer, director of the construction of the Over the River project, also for the Gates project, Vince Davenport, our in pro late project director, Tom Golden, and the right side was all official, federal, county, state, a different agency. And we have this meeting, really, we try to present the project, the timetable of the project, how the project will be built, and many, many things. Now, many years before we have idea about the Over the River, in 1966, we tried to wrap trees during the winter time when the trees have no leaves. We tried to do that project in forest parks in San Luis, Missouri. We never get permission. In 1967-68, we started to negotiate permission to wrap the 383 of Avenue of Champs-Élysées in Paris. We never get permission. And finally, in 1997, we started to negotiate the permission to wrap 178 trees and the Berover Park outside of Basel, Switzerland. We, we discussed with the city of Berover, commune of Berover, we get the permission, and finally, we wrap the 178 trees. This is the view on this day. We have a beautiful sunny day in autumn, on November. We have a winter day. This is cold pictures, and we have a beautiful sunset. Uh, now, in the early, uh, late 50s and early 60s, I did a number of works involving oil barrels, these ordinary steel barrels used by the industry to fill with oil or different product of petrochemical industry. Actually, I did, uh, uh, sometimes the barrel was wrapped, sometimes not wrapped. You can see some of the example of these works in the collection of the Museum of Wurt, uh, the Wurt collection of Germany. They own over 80 of our works, and some of the works they are lending to the traveling exhibition in the National Academy Museum. You can see our early works of that 1958 uh, rap barrels. But also we use the completely... <coughs> it's uh, here in New York at the... Yes, National Muse Academy of Museum. National, National Academy Museum, entrance on Fifth Avenue at 89th Street. Yeah, yeah. In 1962, we did that uh, temporary installation, the wall of 240 barrels, iron curtain was a poetical response to the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was built just a year before. We closed that little street, Rue Visconti, in the left bank in Paris. You cannot go from one other side to another side, and we never get the permission. We tried to get the permission. We never get permission. We did it illegally. And uh, later in the 60s, we started to work on the proposal, and we did several temporary installations in the museum with the barrels, but late in the 60s, we started to work to propose to do a large structure of barrels in Texas and near Galveston. We never get permission, we don't go anywhere. Also, we try to work in proposal to do that large structure of barrels in Holland. We never get permission. Finally, in the late 70s, we arrive in the United Arab Emirates in the Sheikh of Abu Dhabi to propose to build the Mastaba of Abu Dhabi. Now, that is the photo montage, it's not realized yet. It's a structure built by 400,000 oil barrels. The, the Mastaba is not a pyramid, it's the archaic shape that that the pyramid, you have a two perpendicular wall, two slanted wall, a trunked top. Now, slanted wall, that slanted wall, that form it can be created by stacking cylindrical object, and the angle will be always 60 degree. 
And our proposal is to build a structure of 500 feet high by 1,000 feet in the vertical wall is 750 feet in slanted wall. When approaching the vertical wall, you have this 500 feet tall mosaic of multicolored thousands of all bars. In 1999, in museum in Germany, and outside of Düsseldorf, in Oberhausen, in the atrium of that museum, which is a 330 feet atrium in the museum, we installed the wall of 13,000 oil barrels. There was that 80 feet tall, 220 feet long, and 21 feet long. This is temporary installation museum in Germany. Now, we were working in the Gates project between 95 and, and 2000, very, very much with uh, the Central Park Conservancy. That was a very important part to mellow, to explain the project to the Conservancy. And of course, in 2001, in September, there was, was tragedy in New York City. And probably a cause of that tragedy, a good friend of ours, big supporter of our project, was elected the mayor of New York City, Mr. Michael Bloomberg. Mr. Bloomberg was also a was member of the Central Park Conservancy. This is how we start to know Mr. Bloomberg in the uh, mid-90s. And of course, once we have the, uh, that election happen, uh, I remember vividly with late, uh, we were telling, Jean-Claude was telling me that we should leave Mr. Bloomberg for a long time before discussing the Gates project because he inherited the most terrible misery uh, uh, with the, uh, September 11. But in March 2002, three months after the election, by inauguration of uh, Bloomberg, we received a call from the Deputy Mayor Patty Harris and the Park Commissioner Adrian Benepe, and they come to our place downtown Manhattan to discuss how they, we can charter the permitting process for the Gates project. And of course, it was a very important discussion because the very bottom was that where the Gates will go. And we always always saying they will go on the walkways, but we need to say where this, the Gates will go physically. There are so many walkways, and we need to learn uh, uh, how these gates will be and these walkways. This is why in the summer of 2002, before we get the permission of the Gates project, Jean-Claude, myself, and our collaborator, we walk 100 miles for three weeks, pinpoint the place of all the gates. You see what was very important to learn. We need to learn the, how many low branches of tree hanging over the walkways, because we cannot put 16 feet tall gates if the branches of the tree, they are 10 feet or 8 feet above you. And of course, we need to rec uh, record it, the variety width of the walkways. On the right side is our project director, Junita Davenport, and uh, uh, Vince Davenport, our chief engineer, are putting all this information on very huge maps. We work for these three weeks, putting the place of all the gates. Now, Vince Davenport put all these 7,500 gates and seven area. You see, this is the map of Central Park, and all these different colors show you the area of uh, how many gates in each area. Now, all these seven area, they put on 52 very large maps. And I, like to, I don't like to bother you with that, but I will show you one of these 52 maps, how they look. Now, you see, each little mark there is a gate. And you have a number of the area, the width of the gate, a number of the gate. And when you see uh, empty space is low branches. When the gates, they are not obstructed by low branches, the gates, they're only 12 feet apart. That was very important to finalize the number and the place of the gates. Meanwhile, of course, was again, we need to introduce the project to the many guests invited by the city hall, by the park department, and the muni Municipal Art Society here, for example, on 51st and Madison Avenue. Uh, you see the Park Commissioner Benepe, the Central Park President of Central Park Conservancy President, Doug Blonsky and ourselves answering question of the guests invited by the city, the mayor, a different organization. Again, we go back to present the project to the community board. Here, presentation to community board five, who is the 59th Street to 14th Street, very wealthy community board. You see here again, we try to explain the project. And finally, in January 2003, uh, uh, myself, Jean-Claude, and the city of New York, New York and Mr. Bloomberg uh, signed 43 pages contract to give us permission to install the gate. Signing that contract gives us the green light to fabricate the project. I hope you understand. 
all our projects, they happen at a particular time of the year. The case project is the winter project. The over the river project is the summer project. We need at least one and a half, two years lead time to fabricate thousand parts for our project on site. We cannot do the project any time. This is that when we get the permission in January 2003, the earliest time we can do the project was in February 2005. 2004 was impossible to fabricate the things. Now, I, th I can show you how the project will be built, very, not bother you too much, but very simple. We do not make any holes, any things in the ground. Entire structure, which is 16 feet tall, is supported by steel bases, very small size steel bases. They're only six inches high, 12 inches at 48 inches. And of course, they're specially designed to have this specially steel base plate. We have a leveling bolts that allow us to control the vertical position of the gaze. Even though the walkway they are inclined, our gaze will be always vertical because we have these leveling bolts, Jean-Claude pointing there. Having finally designing finish, we start to fabrication. And now we have a seven manufacturer on the East Coast who will work for us for the almost two years now. In Pennsylvania, we have a three manufacturers. We bought 5,000 tons of steel, who is equivalent of two-thirds of the steel of Eiffel Tower. That steel was bought outside of Philadelphia and shipped to manufacturer near Philadelphia and near Massachusetts when they had to cut that steel and fabricate these 15,000 steel bases. They still fabricate them. Meanwhile, we need to also fabricate intricate connection, uh, casted and extruded aluminum. That was done at Pittsburgh. 30,000 of them, like a connect connection between vertical and horizontal pole and the vertical pole to the base. And, f and uh, we need to buy the poles. The poles, they are five by five e inches extruded color saffron poles. was done at Poughkeepsie, New York State. 60 miles of pole, 24 hours around the clock, two months, two months <laughs> fabrication of these 60 miles. And the pole was extruded. I will show you here the cross section of the horizontal pole. The horizontal pole have this cell tunnel. This is how the fabric is uh, attached to the, to, the, uh, to the pole. The only material who is not fabricated in the United States is the fabric and the sewing of the fabric. The fabric is woven in Germany, in Emstetten, and is sewn on 7,500 panels and 25 different width near Leipzig and Roll, and is sent to, uh, to the containers to our assembly plant. In Queens, we have a 30,000 square feet assembly plant. Who receiving for the last two months is receiving all this hardware. For example, you see here, our workers receive the poles, but they need to cut the poles at 45 degree and also drill the poles when the connection of the sleeve and the elbow will be connected there. And see here, already vertical poles with the sleeve receiving there. This is how they will arrive in Central Park. And finally, I will show you large drawings of the gate, who is owned, who is owned by the Guggenheim Museum. Thank you very much. We're ready for your questions. Could you come to a microphone, if you can, if you can? Oh, There's it's, one it's down okay, here. it's a yeah. small room. Just the gentleman's there. talk loud. Uh, why, the question was why. Why we do what we do? Because we are artists, and artists create works of art. Christo and I wish to create works of art of joy and beauty, which we create for us. And every true artist will tell you the same. Artists create for oneself. Our art, like all art, has absolutely no purpose whatsoever. It is good for nothing except to be a work of art. Whether it's the impact 
impact to the stone of the building, or you know, in a more classical ecological sense of what was going to happen to the river because less sunlight might come in. Do you, first of all, is that assumption correct? And how do you prepare for those questions if so? Uh, do you make your own uh, calibrations or do you have uh, environmentalists do studies for you or how does that work? Expensive. Well. Um, the first time ever on planet Earth that a work of art had an environmental impact report was the running fence we did in Northern California in 1976. We believe very much in professionals. When we need uh, contracts, we have lawyers. When we need engineering, it is engineers. And when it is an environmental impact statement or report, they are professional ornithologists, soil specialists. They hire, they hire by government. I, I hope you understand. This thing is not happened by, uh, from us. The, the permitting process is uh, they have a rules. And the government go through the rules. They hire these people. And they independent company. And they uh, pay by us, but they work for the government. Yeah, I, uh, okay, okay, go ahead. Uh, Hi, uh, um, I was wondering two things. One, how are you going to recycle the parts after the gates? And two, I'm sure the fabric has special properties that I would like to hear about. Uh, yes, thank you. We indeed always recycle the materials uh, in many different ways. We purchase industrial materials. So, uh, of course, steel becomes steel again, aluminum becomes, we don't know, some parts of airplanes, some cans of soda pop, whatever aluminum is used for. For instance, the fabric of the Rapt Reichstag was shredded, compacted in large rolls, and gloriously was used as underlay for carpet. <laughs> Everything, because we buy industrially, it is industrially recycled. Yes, the lady. Have you ever envisioned doing a, an exhibit that was permanent? Or have you ever worked on something just for permanent show, as opposed to? Well, for per permanent, yeah. truly, uh, no, never. But. Our engineers told us that if well maintained, the mastaba of Abu Dhabi could remain between 4,000 and 5,000 years, but that is not permanent. <laughs> uh, someone, uh, uh, I yes. had the good fortune to catch you a couple of weeks ago. At, uh, at, so I came back, I liked it so much, at the <laughs> National Academy. And somebody asked the question, that, and your answer, Jean-Claude, so enchanted me, I want to ask it again. Why is your, are your projects always temporary? Thank you. For Christo and I, the temporary character of our works of art is an aesthetic decision. And I will explain. Artists of the past have tried to put into their creation, their work of art, a great variety of different qualities. And they have worked in stone, in marble, in wood, uh, in oil paint, in te with televisions. They have created through the centuries works that have been mythological or um, religious, or portraits, landscapes, all sorts of different qualities. However, there is one quality they have never used, and that is the quality of love and tenderness that we, all of us human beings, have for what does not last. We have love and tenderness for childhood, because we know it will not last. We have love and tenderness for our own lives because we know it will not last. This quality of love and tenderness, we wish to give it to our work of art as an additional aesthetic quality.
Thank you for asking. Other question? Yes. yes. Uh, just a, a question and, and a, a kind of a comment. Uh, the maybe your original idea for wrapping. There was this famous uh, photo uh, that Man Ray did of wrapping a uh, sewing machine. This Enigma. Uh, was that your original inspiration? Uh, uh. <laughs> You know, the use of the fabric is long tradition in the history of art. For a thousand years, the artists used the fabric. Of course, not real fabric, but bronze, wood, marble, painting, fresco. And actually can recognize the folds and pleats. If they're medieval art, the folds, they're much more angular. Baroque art, they're more flamboyant. But the best example of what the fabric do in classical art, and this true story, it's not invented by me, <laughs> is the, uh, case, the case of the French sculptor Rodin. Rodin did two versions of the figure of Balzac. The first version, Balzac was totally naked. Big belly, skinny legs, and many details. <laughs> now what Rodin did, he take the cape, the fabric cape of Balzac, of coat, put it in liquid plaster, and shroud of the figure of Balzac we have now in MoMA and Boulevard Raspail in Paris. And basically, he hide all these elements, all as parts in the body, and highlight the principal proportion of the building, of the body. With the wrap rice tackle, Pondo, for the, our wrapping project, not the running fence, not Valakant, we do exactly the same things. If you're familiar with the rice stack, it's typical Victorian building with a lot of ornaments, decoration, reliefs. They're all hidden by one million square feet of fabric. And only the principal dimension of the building, the towers, the frontals, is there. But in like the classical sculptures, all these still pictures, they're like living objects. They move with the wind, you know, they're not static. They're, they move with the water, with the wind, they're like living objects. This is the for all wrapping project. Now, for the uh, modern art, I know that uh, that was photographed what? of Man Rai, used on the publication of the Minotaur. It never been object. Object was done much later. But the closest things to, to my works is probably the drawing of Henry Moore of 1940 when his drawings called crowd, people, looking and a tight up object. And there was a huge things, wrapped thing and little people looking. I tried to buy that drawings, but we never succeeded to convince him to selling it to us. Oh, thank <laughs> you. I, I, I can't more drawings of 1940. I see. <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, your, your objection to everybody calling whatever you do wrapping, even yes, when it's yeah. not wrapping. Yeah. Uh, I was trying in some way to generalize, to, to uh, say, well, maybe in a metaphorical or more general way, you could make an argument that everything is wrapping, like, like the uh, umbrellas, you might call that like partial wrapping no. of an no, area. No, 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 no. I mean, yeah. I can't yeah. metaphorically You extend. may, sir. You may, because we live in a free country, <laughs> but it's wrong. <laughs> no, I tell you, the fabric also is the most important element to continue Jean-Claude's temporary character. The fabric is the principal element to translate this nomadic quality of our project. They're very nomadic. They're very airy. They're not solid, yeah. strong like that. They're fabricated off-site. They come very fast, and they change very fast. And of course, they're very fragile. They're very vulnerable. They can pass through the fabric, can break the fabric, very essential. For example, when we wrapped the rice stack, there was the see-through working fence, and thousands of people was watching our rock climbers, was putting the ropes, etc. After that, we removed the see-through working fence, and the millions of people was walking around the rice stack. And these people was walking, is the touching the fabric, touching. You don't see people in Manhattan walking, touching the buildings. Now, that is a very important part. You know, the build, the, our project, they have this very strong, uh, attractive, teasing dimension. Of course, also, they have the presence, when they exist for these 14 days, they were, have a presence of missing. What I try to tell you that they will be never again the same things. There will be never another valley curtain. There will be never another surrounding island. There will never another gates. There will be never another rap bridge. Basically, that uniqueness of the project is the principal 
the energy of these works. They happen once, we are bombarded in late 20th century with the banal and trivial, trivial repetitious things. And the humans like to be present in something unique. So, thank you. Central Park will never be closed. Our 600 workers in teams of eight will be working there, and anybody can go and watch them and encourage them. Not, don't talk too much to them because they have a hard work to do. Uh, nobody asked, but Christo would like me to explain the schedule. Well, the schedule has started. Uh, the 5,000 tons of steel for the bases is every day, starting yesterday, being brought to Central Park, but not at the location where they will be. That will be January. Now they are just stacked all at one place on a road that the people don't use anyway, and that will take until probably mid-January or early January, and I hope you all understood what Christo said, 5,000 tons of steel 15, for 15,000 bases. 5,000 tons of steel is the equivalent of two-thirds of the steel of the Eiffel Tower. But we are not <laughs> stacking it upwards. <laughs> the reason those steel bases are stuck there is to save time because on January 3, approximately 100 professional steel workers will be bringing those steel bases and put them where they belong. And where they belong is already marked. That was done in September and October. If you walk in Central Park, you will see on the walkway, a green maple leaf has been sprayed right there on the hard surface and 12 feet later, a green dot, and 12 feet later, a green dot, until an entire segment has been marked, that is where the steel base will come. When that segment is finished and cannot continue because of low branches, then the maple leaf is reversed. So our, our, our iron workers will know that that is the end of that segment. Then, January 3, they will take the bases, put them where they belong, throughout Central Park, all over 23 miles of it, from 59th Street to 110th Street, and from east to west. That's a lot of work. But then, on February 3, 4, 5, and 6, 600 unskilled workers are going to go to our assembly plant in Queens. And just outside our assembly plant, we have a large space outdoor where they are going to be taught what it is they are going to do in Central Park. They will elevate the gates and do everything. Then, February 7th, weather permitting, because what Christo and I create, as I already said, are works of art of joy and beauty. But for our workers too, it has to be joy. If the weather is an abomination, we're not going to punish our worker, workers and ask them to work in a horrible weather. So February 7, weather permit, permitting the 600 in their uniforms in teams of eight. Each team of eight is in charge of their own 100 gates. And they will elevate the gate, bolt it to the steel base. They will not open the cocoon, which is all the way at the top on the horizontal pole. The fabric is closed 
inside a cocoon. And when they elevate the gate and bolt it to the base, they do not unfurl the fabric. They do not touch the cocoon. They go to the next gate, elevate it, bolt it, don't touch the cocoon. We give them five days to do all that. There are 100 gates, each team of eight. Five days is probably too long. We know from experience because we have built life-size tests. We build life-size tests for every project. We have to. We, we don't know how to do it. Nobody else has ever done it. So we need the life-size test for the gates we built for. Uh, three life-size tests in the 80s and one in October uh, 2002. Of course, not in Central Park. We went far away from Central Park, as far away as we could go, the state of Washington. <laughs> anyway, uh, five days is too long, but what if we have one or two days of storm and they cannot work? Then, on Saturday, February 12, weather permitting, throughout Central Park, 7,500 cocoons will be opened, the fabric will come down, and that's when you will enjoy the gates. They will stay 16 days. The gates will stay, thank you. I don't <coughs> the gates will stay 16 days. Now, in their uniform, our young monitors, not, so, not all so young, our monitors will be there uh, to assist the public, answer questions. The question very often is, what is it for? <laughs> and they will know to answer, oh, it's for nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> it's only a work of art. And they will distribute one million fabric samples for free as a souvenir to those who request it. Uh, at the Reichstag, we dis our monitors distributed 1,250,000 free fabric samples. And afterwards, after 16 days, it will be the reverse procedure and uh, it will be removed and all will be recycled. Yes, sir. What is the estimated cost of this project? Because each one of our project is a child of ours, we do not have a budget. We hope it will be around $20 million, including the $3 million check we have already given to the city of New York. Donation. It's our donation. Well, yes, it's our <laughs> donation. <laughs> yeah, because uh, we also gave a check for $250,000 uh, just in case Christo and I will, would forget to remove the gates. <laughs> That's in addition. And there is a $1 million line of credit also given to the city uh, in case we disappear in South America and don't <laughs> remove the gates. Anyway, we hope it will be around 20 million and not more, but just like bringing up a child, it will cost us whatever it has to cost which is the same for every project, and for every project, every project has always cost us the same thing. I don't say the same amount of dollars, but the same thing, which means everything we've got plus everything we were able to borrow from the bank. <laughs> yes. Uh, Maisel's, yes, Albert Maisel's is finishing right now the Gates film, which he and his brother David, David is no longer alive, they started the Gates film in 1979. They have 40 hours. Of they have 40 hours already of the Gates film. And yes, they will do it. And I recommend to all of you to try to see uh, the five films that uh, mm -hmm. Maisel's have done, their Valley Curtain film, for instance, was nominated for the Academy Award. None of the five films on five projects, none of them are art films. You won't be bored. Those five DVDs are 
real life documentary and when our iron workers say dirty words the dirty words are there <laughs> but you should see it because uh, it does not substitute for the project because the project is once in a lifetime crystal told you never to be repeated and if you have not experienced it you will never see it we not only like the words once in a lifetime but Christo and I are much younger than we look. We also love the words once upon a time. Yes. Yes, many ah. people wanted to buy umbrellas. a few umbrellas and our answer was an umbrella, two umbrellas is not a work of art. 3,100 umbrellas at the same time, blue in Japan, yellow in California, that and the same for the gate. One gate, two gates, three gates is not a work of art, but 7,500 gates in Central Park in February 2005, that is a work of art. If we had said yes to the people who wanted to buy our giant umbrellas, it would have paid for all the $26 million we spent. No, no, <laughs> we are not hiring anymore. Because the uh, we had 2,000 applications on the internet and the project director, Jonita Davenport, has already answered and selected the 600 we need. Too bad, you look strong. Yes. <laughs> And willing. Yes. yes. I was fortunate enough to be able to see the exhibit about the project at the Hall. And I'm curious uh, to know, was it simply time constraints that had it, had it, had it, had it, had it to be such a short period of time that it was there? Is it was four months, sir. Yeah. I know, I took people back constantly. Yeah. No, no, no. Four months exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum for artists who have not been dead for the past 250 <laughs> years. No, no, it's wait, wait. very long. I think my question is, was it a matter of scheduling that it could not have been uh, in place closer to? Uh, oh, no, no, we no. did not want that. You would want that. Because it helps us very much. I'm sure you all belong one way or the other uh, to the art world. And the fact that it started in April last year, uh, this year, uh, that helped us tremendously because the rich people who live around Central Park, it opened their eyes and they started buying much better. After uh, Later, closer to the project, would have been very late for us. <laughs> and I'm sure Philippe de Montebello chose it that way to help us. Yes, sir. No. Thank you, sir. We never have volunteers. Everybody who has ever worked at our project has been paid, except my mother. No. But, <laughs> but everybody is paid. No volunteers. And we have finished hiring. We have all the people we need. No. I, are you a steel worker? No. 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 All the, st all the, the no only st people who are not completely hired are the 100 steel, professional steel workers. All the others, non skill 600, they pay everybody paid, mm. but Quarto they are already hired. What we pay the professional workers, of course, is professional normal pay, but the non-skilled workers, the 600, we are very stingy, Christo and I. We are, we are, we are only paying one quarter above minimum wage. Minimum wage plus one quarter, symbolic, because $5. minimum wage is not nice. Yeah, what? $5.35. I don't know how much. I, don't, I truly, I don't know how much is minimum wage, because why should I, more than, than now, not sleep at night, <laughs> we'll have to pay it anyway, so I don't want to know. And if it goes up, don't tell me. We'll have to pay. Is the exhibit still up at the National Academy? Is there anything up now? Yes, yes. At, at the National Academy Museum. Uh, until when does that? Right now, until January 2, 
-hmm. And it's an exhibition titled Christo and Jean-Claude, uh, the Wirt Museum Collection. Wirt is a museum in Germany. Mm -hmm. And there you will see works from the 50s, 60s, 70s, until today. When I say works, I have to explain something that you could read on, the, uh, on our website, but I must explain. There is a difference between the name of the artist Christo and the name of the two artists, Christo and Jean-Claude. It is not the same thing. Every work which is created to belong indoor, um, early wrapped objects of the 50s, 60s, packages, drawings, collages, scale models, lithographs, all the preparatory works, all those belong indoor and are created by Christo, signed by Christo, because I do not know how to draw. As a matter of fact, there are three things we do not do together, Christo and I. We never fly the same airplane. I do not know how to draw, so Christo is the one who puts our ideas on paper. And the third thing we do not do together is that all these years, and we met in 1958, and all those years, I have consistently and constantly deprived Christo of the joy to work with our tax accountant. <laughs> but when a work is large scale, temporary, most of the time outdoor, but not always, then that is a work by Christo and Jean-Claude. So you, you have seen um, diapositive uh, color slides of preparatory works showing what we believe the gates will look like in Central Park and those done by Christo but when you come to Central Park in February next year then you will see a work by Christo and Jean-Claude. So yes sir. Is, um, oh, sorry. Wow, you have two hours. <laughs> you answer okay. that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, let me hear. Uh, all, all our projects have these two distinct periods. Software, distinct period. Software period and hardware period. The software period of our project is when it's only idea. Uh, I make drawings and the, ha and the hate of thousand people who try to stop us and a thousand people try to help us. And of course, that is the, the most difficult period because I say before, we never do the same things again. We do not know how to do the things. We don't know first time we're discussing the things. And that software period built his own uh, energy, all, own identity. This is also the principal reason why we not accept commissions. Because we like to develop the personality of the project. And the personality of the project is developed to the permitting process. Permitting the process develop this tremendous energy they, because controversy and the thinking what the work should be. And that creates the, the soul and the, 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 the um, um, personality of the work. And of course, after that is the hardware period. The hardware period is when we have physical elements, the real things, the object. Now, these two, them all together. And this is why you say very well that we are a little bit architect exactly because our project inherits many things who they inherit in the space. Like, for example, nobody discussed the painting of one painter before the painting is painted. <laughs> nobody argued, discussed the sculpture of one sculptor before the sculptor is sculpted. But everybody discussing the building new airport before it is built, it, new highway, new bridge. Before they build it. And our project they discuss before they exist physically because these have this inherent elements that they are in the realm of architecture and urban planning. They are, and this is one of the reasons we like to do our, our projects. You know, 
um, typical three-dimensional work of art is like that bottle, you know. The sculptor sculpt the surface, if you go around, suddenly the sculpture can be very big, like Alexander Calder, you can walk inside, can be television set here, another thing set there, but all this space is entirely designed by the artist, by the sculptor. And that how much should be there, how should be there. That is typical three-dimensional, traditional sculptural space, even contemporary art. Then another space we think very little about. The moment you go on the street and you walk on the sidewalk, somebody design the sidewalks. You take your car, you drive the car, somebody decide these roads. The red lights, the, all this movement is designed actually 24 hours around the clock we are funneled to highly regulated space with uses, logistic, meanings, all kind of regulation. Now what we do, jean claude and myself, we borrow that space and create gentle disturbance for a few days. By borrowing that space, we inherit everything what is inherent to that space to become part of the work of art. We don't invent the politics in the Reichstag. It was in the Reichstag. The real things, the real. The real. We don't invent the ecology in Biscayne Bay. It was in Biscayne Bay. If we don't invent the magnitude of the meanings that millions of New Yorkers have for Central Park, it was in Central Park. By Borrowing the space in Central Park, the work inherited this tremendous energy, a controversy that park is owned by all the New Yorkers, and every New Yorker have the rights to use uh, thinking about the park. And of course, the work absorbed that element and became they give the really the force of the work. And it's very much all these projects. They you look them physically; they have these elements. For example, the surrounded island is look like a shaped canvas, very horizontal, flat, with a pond of bridge wrapped. It's like a sculpture. It can be 1,000 feet chisel, or like a drapery. But uh, for, 40, for 14 days, the Pond of Rap was also a bridge. The people was walking over the fabric. The boat was passing under the fabric. The bridge was functioning under like the, architecture. Under the arches. Under the arches. And for example, I vividly remember when we tried to get permission for the Umbrellas project in Japan. It was so difficult, especially with central government in Tokyo. Uh, uh, we installed these huge two-story high umbrellas, thousands of them, and I, I was saying to our friends, writers in New York, that is like a colonizing the space, like poetical colonization of space. They are village with few houses, and we're adding more houses. Of course, roof, the uh, roof without walls, uh, uh, the shelter without walls. And of course, many friends say, ah, Christo say that is colonization of the space. Now, to get the permission for the Ministry of Construction, central government in Tokyo, was one of the most difficult. They worked for one year, the bureaucrats of Ministry of Construction in Tokyo, with, the, with, with our engineers, and working tag to give us permission. After one year, and the cost of one million dollars, they wrote permits in the site of New York telephone book. And the bureaucrats of the central government of Ministry of Construction in Tokyo give us permission to install 1,340 houses. The bureaucrats got better our idea than any writer. The way they understand exactly we were building houses because we were colonizing the space. And this is how this project works. And of course, we like to do it. We like to involve that thing. So, of, of course, uh, uh, if you don't like to have this relation, you don't do that. Of course, artists naturally have his studio, he do his work. But we like to have this energy coming through permitting process. But we are not engineers. We always have wonderful engineers working with us. Yes. Uh, could you elaborate on your seasonal decisions? You say you'd <laughs> like to, to uh, key the work to a particular season. For instance, in the slideshow, you, you had the pathway that brought out the yellow and the, the fall foliage. Now, I'm thinking that you know, in the winter, Saffron, not orange. The, the Talk a little more about your seasonal Well, we have chosen February for the gates because February is the only month of the year on which we can truly count that there will be no leaves on the branches of the trees so that far, far away through the leafless branches you can see the work of art. When there are leaves, you don't see anything. That's why we chose February. Yeah. And of course, the, the, but, uh, no, but uh, of well, course, the why, other we, things. why we chose summer for over the river is because we want the <laughs> rafters. the rafters to see the to, project for, for six hours. 
During the winter time, there are no rafting. And there are no rafting except summer. Yeah. No. The, surround the surrounded yeah. islands, we were, the, the, the we were very careful not to do it at the hurricane season. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was wondering if you have a favorite. The young lady wants to know if we have a favorite project, and we always give the same silly answer. Would you ask a father and a mother who have many children? which one is your favorite, they'll never tell you. We do not have a favorite, except throughout all those long years, we always have had one favorite, and it has always been the same one, and it's always the next one. <laughs> I have a yes, question, please. I have a question about your uh, collaboration. Um, all of the outdoor projects, all of the public projects, are collaborations of Christo and Jean-Claude. Uh, ultimately, there's only going to be either Christo, Christo or Jean-Claude. One of you will probably predecease the other. Oh, that happens. Oh, tragically. <laughs> uh, especially since you talk about flying separately and you're, you're obviously being yes, careful yes. about that. Yes. So some thought must have been given to what that period would be like. <laughs> no. But I, I would ask you, I'm only asking it this way, okay, I only no, ask don't, you don't. this let, way. Let it be a happy evening. Fine. Would there be any public projects, though, of the kind that have been collaborative no, at that point? No, we should explain We don't know the future. Yeah. No, we explained it. In the 40 years, we realized 18 projects, and we failed to get permission for 37 projects. Mm -hmm. You understand? And of course, it, 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 some project we, uh, we kept alive, like the Berlin project, the Reichstag or the Gates or the uh, Paris project. And some project we lost interest, we don't like to do it anymore. But there, one project, tell the story, very nice. Project oh, we worked for nine years. Yes. Many, many years ago, we requested from the uh, Lord Mayor of Barcelona in 1975 permission to wrap the tallest um, column and statue of Christopher Columbus, which is uh, on the harbor of Barcelona, Spain. And the Lord Mayor said no, and he was assassinated, but not by us. <laughs> <laughs> and later we asked another mayor of Barcelona if we could wrap the monument to Cristobal Colón, and he said no. And he too was assassinated, but not by us. And one day, and that was nine years after we had first re requested it, the mayor of Bas Barcelona, Pascual Maragai, sent us a telegram saying, please come to Barcelona and do it. <laughs> and of course our friends tease us because they say, he didn't want to be assassinated. <laughs> but, but when he asked us to do it, nine years after we had first requested it, Christo and I, we felt very much like when a, a mother says to her son, my son, you ask for a red tricycle, here it is. And the son answers, but mother, I'm 47 years old now. I don't want it anymore. It was no longer in our heart. And all our projects come from ideas that come out of our two hearts and our two heads, never other people's ideas. Mademoiselle. Uh, I was oh, wait, before you ask your question, I want to say, those of you who wish to leave, we understand. Go right ahead. We don't take it personally, but I don't want to cut it short just because of a few. We we don't want to cut it short. You want us to cut oh, it short? I mean, we can go for another ten minutes, perhaps okay. something like that. Ten hours, okay. Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead. But. Before, well, uh, when we met, we were 23 years old, 
and for the <laughs> and for 200 years before that we were we didn't exist we <laughs> how can we answer that what we did before we've been working for a long long time but uh, nothing before yes, yes. It, it's it's a very excellent question, but that really will take a long time, and we prefer the specialist to answer you, the ornithologist, the traffic the, people, the, the traffic people. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, we work with them. The, absolutely, we work, we work the and that is a question for the park conservancy and park department to answer because they have studied that. As a matter of fact, they have studied that for 25 years. <laughs> yes. Well, well, other pieces of art, no. Um, many years ago, yes, Cristo once in Italy uh, wrapped a wooden Madonna, yeah. but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a work of art. It <laughs> was, <laughs> we bought it at the, we bought it at the flea market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Pont Neuf um, yeah. is, uh, is an architecture uh, work, yes, but... Sir, sure. Uh, it, uh, but there too, over the river and the gates. The over the no, river no, is the no. next project. We have two works in progress. We spend For one, we have the permit, that is the gates in Central Park. The other one is over the river. We do not have the permit yet. We don't have a permit. The environmental impact is being done, and uh, the process of permit is advancing very well in Colorado but we do not have the permit yet. The young gentleman. I've noticed in the fabrics that you have chose that there is a translucent property to them. Is there a special meaning to the translucence in the mm -hmm. fabrics that you chose? Uh, no, the fabric we chose for over the river over, is woven loosely. It's Very translucent only when seen from underneath, which means with the light. Now, if you take your jacket and put put it in front of the light, I bet you it'll be slightly translucent. Once, it, once there is a, a strong light, like a sun, no. in the back of almost everything, not a piece of cardboard, but a fabric, no, but the, the fabric it'll be translucent. The, the fabric of over the river is especially woven very loosely. The thread they open like that, it's not tight like your jacket, and of course, it was woven to have this tremendous vision from from but from I above. didn't mean your outside jacket, but the beige one. Oh. The <laughs> Over there. What happens to the bodies of fabric after It is recycled. Remember I explained how the wrapped Reichstag fabric had been recycled? What I it's everything is recycled. No waste. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, have. yes, it has happened. Yeah. And Valley Curtain, yes. And Australia Coast also. We need to redo it. Yeah, and, Paris, and, the, and the umbrellas, yes. Mother Nature sends us the wind, and she is our best friend because she gives life to the fabric, the movement. But sometimes she's too generous, <laughs> and it's not so good. But that's a chance we have to take. Yes. On Saturday, February 12, weather permitting, as soon as there, there is enough daylight in the morning so that we can see what we are doing, it will be. Each team open his uh, Each team of eight. 
From 110th Street to 59th Street Central Throughout Park. the park. Yes. Indeed. What happens with a heavy snowstorm on the Well, <coughs> once, once the gates are standing, then it can take any weather. Okay, and, and we know <coughs> that with the snow, it will be beautiful. Because in the life size test we did in the state of Washington, uh, those 18 gates for the life size <laughs> They remained in the Cascade Mountains, in the storm, in the wind, in the snow, and we know how beautiful they will be with, with the snow because they remained there for seven months in the state of Washington. We are wishing, Christo and I, for a little bit of snow, just for aesthetic, but not big snow, <laughs> because our contract with the city of New York, which is 43 pages, stipulates that we must shovel the snow on every walkways where there is there are gates. So a little bit of snow. <laughs> yes, sir. Our insurance company deals with, with all that. Yeah, but they, you know, they're like a construction shop, you know, like a building buildings. This project involved all kind of uh, 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 um, insurance company, all kind of, uh, but it's because it's public space, not only the gates. It is That's exactly the same as any construction job. The real construction jobs that are good for something, useful, yeah. well, our work of art deals with exactly all the other, absolutely everything the same, except it's not useful. It's the only difference. It's a construction job. Yes. I believe that all your work is about freedom. Yes. I wonder if you could expand on that freedom. What, what, what I'm saying right. is that, you know, we, the, it, uh, we, wish <coughs> we wish to do what we want, where we want it, how we want it, but not always when we want it. And, okay. and having sponsors would keep, take our freedom away because we live in a civilization in which the people who pay for something have something to say. And a sponsor could tell us, oh yeah, okay, we'll pay for the gates, but we don't like that color. No, but we can't have that. <laughs> the important part is that this, this project, they deal with the, uh, um, Actually, they're, not, they're owned by nobody. The basic of this project is about the freedom. When they appear for a few days, 14 days or 16 days, you feel that even myself, Jean-Claude, we don't own this project. They're there for a short time. They are absolutely irrational, with no reason to be there. They have no, not because some bureaucrat or minister or president of republic like to have them, because the artists like to have them. This is simply artists. The world can live without valley curtain, without running fence, perfectly. No, nobody needs this project. Of course, carrying that dimension, the absolute irrational dimension, the level that you cannot buy the work, you cannot own the work, you cannot charge tickets for that work. Nobody can own these works. This is why they will go away, because possession is the enemy of the permanence. Okay. Let me thank Christo and Jean-Claude, and thank you all for coming. Okay, thank you, thank you.